Hello and welcome. This is uh, to this International idea session on budgeting and financing of elections. My name is Ia Gasplund and I work here at International idea as a program officer. Today I'm joined by Fiona Rowley, our executive director and formerly the deputy chief election officer at the Election Commission of South Africa. Um, before we begin, uh, Fiona, I'd like to, uh, maybe it would be interesting for the audience to know a little bit about your professional background. Sure. Um, I started, uh, qual I qualified as a chartered accountant with KPMG in South Africa and then spent some time at District Audit, the service delivery arm for the Audit Commission in the UK, uh, doing audits in the public sector. And it was there that I developed a love of the public sector in general as opposed to commercial work. Um, I moved to South Africa with PwC then, um, also working as a consultant mainly and auditor in the public sector for about 20 years doing work um, for a variety of clients that involved uh, strategy enhancement and delivery of strategy, finance function improvement, um, structure reviews and so forth. And it was whilst I was at PwC that I was seconded originally to the Electoral Commission to act as their chief financial officer. I was subsequently permanently appointed to that post and then promoted to Deputy Chief Electoral Officer, where I was responsible for the full range of corporate services functions, HR, IT, legal services, um, finance, risk management, and strategy. Um, and it was from there, ultimately, that I ended up here looking for a new challenge and to broaden my understanding of democracy in general. Thank you. Um, so let's jump in. First question. Um, maybe you could describe a little bit about how the Election Commission of South Africa gets its funds and uh, what process it follows when negotiating that budget. Sure. Uh, ongoing costs versus maybe specific electoral costs? Sure. Uh, in South Africa, the, the budgeting cycle in government is uh, driven by two key processes. One is the medium-term economic framework, which is a rolling three-year budgeting cycle, wherein uh, you budget for the current year and the two subsequent years. And that's supplemented every year by an E&E &E process, the estimates of national expenditure, wherein you detail uh, more thoroughly and review the in-year costs which are then voted in Parliament. To determine our costs we needed to have an understanding of what our current electoral delivery model was as well as then a view three years in the future. Because we operated a five-year cycle wherein we would have in one year Two, uh, two registration weekends uh, wherein we would encourage all eligible citizens to come and register to, to vote, followed by a municipal election. Then two registration weekends followed by a national and provincial election in the fourth year. And finally, in the fifth year, a relatively flat year where we would look at our internal processes and do the kinds of things we couldn't do when in the midst of the electoral um, cycle, like um, refresh our IT systems, uh, refresh our IT hardware and so forth. Because of the, the way the, the structures work in South Africa, we were part of the Home Affairs vote to Parliament for our annual budget. But given the need for us to secure our independence, and obviously independence for us was a critical issue, although we were part of the Home Affairs vote, we didn't directly negotiate with Home Affairs, we directly negotiated with Treasury. And as I said, that sort of three-year cycle um, of budgeting, we would determine which of the activities were key in those three years and uh, develop a budget literally on a project-by-project -project basis and have detailed discussions with National Treasury where they would interrogate us relatively rigorously, obviously because of the need to ensure value for money um, for any amount spent out of the public purse. And they would uh, discuss with us the cost drivers and the elements that were contained within that detailed budget before finally uh, submitting it through to Parliament for vote and approval. Mm -hmm. Thank you. In that case, out of um, uh, interest, it would be good to know how the budget for the Commission was developed uh, and uh, <coughs> I guess what methodology was used, um, who was involved also. And lastly, 
does the commission uh, operational plan include a budget? I presume so, but yeah. Certainly. Um, no operational plan can be complete without a budget. The first and, and fundamental step of any budget is to have a, a detailed and granular understanding of the service delivery model, which means that we needed to have a, a detailed understanding of the electoral law and the mechanisms by which that electoral law was going to be translated into practice. It means that we needed to understand completely what the cost drivers were. And in terms of the election in South Africa, the critical drivers were securing of venues for voting stations. We had 22,610 voting stations where we needed to secure and contract with providers, normally churches, mm. um, uh, schools, community maybe. halls, schools, yeah. those kinds of things. Then we needed to staff the elections. In our particular circumstance, we employed around 200,000 temporary staff for the election period, um, and that was a critical cost driver. Uh, there was a bill of materials, obviously, the, the, the sort of the kit you need to have an election, the ballot boxes, the voting booths, the, the ballot papers, mm. the stationery packs, etc. Um, and then there were sort of the ancillary matters, perhaps, like the voter education campaigns that we carried out and the advertising campaigns we carried out. So it was understanding what all these relevant components were and then identifying how much we needed of each component Component and what the projected costs were. And we did that by, as I said, we had a project-based uh, budgeting system and we would sit uh, periodically throughout the throughout the year and throughout the cycle with the, the key operations people for each relevant article and hold with them the kind of rigorous conversations we knew we were going to have with Treasury mm -hmm. to say, okay, now you say that you need X number of ballot boxes. How is this number derived? How did you develop the cost per ballot box, etc.? And therefore build from this model a total operational budget. Great. Um, now, in your opinion, uh, during the time you were working at the Commission, what were the main financing or budgeting challenges? With anything that's that's um, financed from the public purse, the desire to achieve maximum benefit for minimum outlay in the context of ever-increasing service delivery demands mm. from the government as a whole is a critical driver. Um, with an election, we were we were actually fortunate. I mean, there was a, a high level of understanding and support from Treasury for the need for us to be able to be funded to do our job because one of the critical failures or potential issues for any electoral commission in holding a free and fair election is that is um, not necessarily possible if you don't have adequate funding to ensure, for example, that you can have adequate numbers of voting stations open that will enable public participation and so forth. Um, but the challenge was always for us to critically examine and keep re-examining our service delivery model to ensure that we were doing the best that we could with the resources that we had. Mm. One of the things we did, for example, was look at how we staffed voting stations and whether we had an optimal number of staff. Now, on election day, although you have a, a voter's role and you hope to achieve maximum turnout, you can never tell how many people are going to turn up at a particular voting station. So we put plans in place to provide teams of um, flexible staff who could be rapidly deployed. They were trained and available and paid a standby amount to keep them available. But then if they were deployed, they were paid additional. And those teams were held in order that we could rapidly deploy them to a voting station where queues were getting excessive or there were particular issues somebody hadn't turned up. I mean, when you're employing 210,000 people mm. on a day, somebody is going to wake up in the morning and discover their battery is flat and they can't get to, to work or whatever. So we did those kinds of things. Mm? Out of curiosity, it would be also interesting what was the most expensive uh, line item in terms of like the election. Uh, was there a, a particular process or was there a certain thing that was quite expensive? 
definitively for us, it was the electoral staff, the 210,000 people. Uh, in an election year, our budget was in the region of 2 billion rand. And of that, about 330,000, uh, 330 million rand was uh, directed at employing those uh, temporary electoral staff, the 210 of them. 210,000, and then the 4,500 area managers that were employed to coordinate and troubleshoot within the areas. That for us was by far our biggest cost element. You talked a little bit before about cost saving. Um, I, I'm sure that there's more, more to say on the topic. Uh, was there any initiative during your time uh, at the Commission where there was a cost saving uh, drive or push? Always and constantly, as I said, we used to hold debriefs after every election and critically evaluate what worked and what didn't work and uh, ensure that we could achieve maximum efficiency and effectiveness, not only in terms of the actual delivery of the election, but also in terms of the administrative processes that underpinned that. Like the 210,000 staff, for example, mm. we needed to pay them after the election. And you can imagine the processing burden that that created. So we looked at innovative ways of um, reducing that administrative burden and as a consequence the, the, the costs that underpin that. But to some extent with an election, again, your, your drivers are outside of your control. They're very much based on the number of registered voters, the number of voting stations and so forth. So you have to always be careful when considering cost savings that you don't damage the the integrity of the election as a result of trying to save costs by not staffing a voting station as a consequence mm. and then disabling public participation because the queues are too long and people don't want to don't want to vote or stand in the so there's always a balance that you need to to maintain in this regard mm? Thank you much, very much, Fiona Rowley, for taking part in this session on budgeting and financing of elections. And thank you very much to the audience for watching. Thank you.